Hi everyone, and welcome back. In our last lesson, we learned how to determine the equation of a tangent plane to a parametric surface at a given point. The key was to look at these vectors, the vectors r, u, and r, v, which are tangent to our grid lines at that given point. Based on what we knew about parametric curves, we were able to obtain formulas for r, u, and r, v. r, u can be obtained by differentiating our three component functions, x, y, and z, with respect to u, and r, v can be obtained by differentiating those same functions with respect to v. Now it turns out that r, u, and r, v can also be used to compute something else that's very, very important when talking about surface integrals. That's our next topic. They can be used to compute the surface area of one of these parametric surfaces. Notice that the total surface area is really the sum of the areas of each of these patches, right? So if we can approximate the area of a patch, then we can add up our approximations to approximate the total area of this surface. All right, let's zoom in on one of these patches, maybe this guy right here. If the point in the corner is r of u i v j, well then up here, we're gonna be moving to our next u grid line, right? So this would be r of u i plus one v j. And over here, we're moving to our next v grid line. We have r of u i v j plus one. Now, I don't know how to find the area of this patch exactly, right? It's all curved and probably quite difficult to work with, but I can approximate the area using the vectors r, u, and r, v. I'm gonna take the tangent vector along this u grid line, and I'm gonna scale it down so it's approximately the same length as this curved line. My tangent vector was r, u, and now I'm gonna scale it down by the change in u. So I'm gonna multiply it by delta u, i. And likewise, I'm gonna do the same thing with my other tangent vector. I'm gonna take this tangent vector here and scale it down to be approximately the same length as this segment here. I'm gonna multiply it by delta Vj. All right, now notice that these tangent vectors are gonna form a parallelogram over the patch. The parallelogram is much, much easier to work with, and its area is gonna approximate the area of the patch. Right now, it might not look too close, but when we shrink the patches down really, really small, the error is gonna be insignificant. So how do we find the area of this parallelogram? Well, if you think back to the very beginning of the course, when I first told you about cross products, I mentioned that if you take the norm of the cross product of two vectors, you exactly get the area of the parallelogram that they form. We haven't used that fact up until now, but here is where it's needed. So the area of our patch is approximately the area of this parallelogram, which is the cross product of RU delta UI with RV delta VJ. Now, since delta UI and delta VJ are constants, they can be pulled out of the norm and out of the cross product, giving us an area of the norm of RU cross RV times delta ui delta vj. That's an approximation of the area of one patch. To approximate the total surface area, we're gonna add up those approximations. The surface area is approximately the sum over all patches of the norm of ru cross rv times delta ui delta vj. And I think you know the drill, right? At this point, we're gonna let the number of patches go off to infinity. The patches are gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller, and this sum is gonna become an integral. Our actual surface area can be written as the double integral over all u and v, so I'm just gonna say d for the domain of our parameters, of the norm of r u cross r v, and then this d u d v term we can write as d a so we can find our surface area using a double integral. Let's check out an example. All right, let's see if we can use our new approach to find the surface area of a sphere, a sphere of radius A. Okay, well our formula depended on us knowing a parametrization for our surface, so we first need a parametrization for our sphere. We've seen how to do this previously. We can use spherical coordinates. In spherical coordinates, x is given by rho sine phi cos theta, but now our radius rho is a fixed constant a, so x is a sine phi cos theta. Similarly, y is a sine phi sine theta, 
and z is going to be a cos phi. Now, since we're taking the entire sphere, phi can range from 0 to pi, and theta can range from 0 to 2 pi. And there you go. We have a parametrization of our sphere. The parametric equation we'll call r of phi theta. Now, to find our surface area, we're going to need to compute a double integral. The double integral of the norm of r sub phi cross r sub theta dA. Phi and theta are our parameters, so they're playing the roles of u and v. We need to compute r sub phi and r sub theta first. So r sub phi we get by differentiating this expression with respect to phi. That's going to give us a cos phi cos theta, a cos phi sine theta, and minus a sine phi. What about r theta? Well, this time we're going to differentiate with respect to theta, right? That's going to give us minus a sine phi sine theta, a sine phi cos theta, and zero, right? There's no theta in our z term. All right, we have our phi, we have our theta, we need their cross product. The cross product is given by the determinant of this ugly looking matrix. I've just put i, j, k in the top row and our two vectors in the second and third row. Now, if you evaluate this determinant and clean it up with some basic trig identities, you should get a squared sine squared phi cos theta, a squared sine squared phi sine theta, and a squared sine phi cos phi. Try it as an exercise. On the next slide, we're going to take the norm of this vector and integrate. Okay, the norm of our cross product is the norm of this hideous looking vector. Now don't be intimidated. Let's just apply our norm formula and see what happens. To calculate the norm, we have to add up the squares of the entries and take the square root. So we have the square root of a to the 4 sine to the 4 phi cos squared theta plus a to the 4 sine to the 4 phi sine squared theta plus a to the 4 sine squared phi cos squared theta. Notice that both the first term and second term have an a to the 4 sine to the 4 phi. So we can factor that out, leaving us with cos squared theta plus sine squared theta. Those add to 1. On my next line, I'm going to have a to the 4 sine to the 4 phi plus my last term, a to the 4 sine squared phi cos squared phi. Ah, more common factors. Each term has an a to the 4 sine squared phi. I'll pull that out of the square root. That gives me a squared sine phi, and in the square root, I'm left with sine squared phi plus cos squared phi. Ah, that's one. We're simply left with a squared sine phi. Okay, now I know this was a long computation, but it was worth it. Knowing the norm of this cross product is gonna help us later on. I'm gonna refer back to this example in some of our future lessons. For now, let's wrap up this problem. The surface area of the sphere is given by the double integral over d, all possible values of our parameters phi and theta, of the norm of r phi cross r theta dA. Now we've calculated this norm. We have the double integral over d of a squared sine phi dA. If you remember that phi goes from 0 to pi and theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, you can set this up as an iterated integral. The integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to pi of a squared sine phi d phi d theta. Now the integration here is the easiest part of the problem, so I'll let you verify that we get a final answer of 4 pi a squared, just as we'd expect. Okay, now as we've just seen, these surface area computations can often be pretty long and pretty ugly. But if you happen to be working in the special case where your surface S is the graph of a function, z equals f of x, y, then the computations are often a lot nicer. If S is the graph of a function, then we can parametrize it using this vector function, r of x, y equals x, y, f of x, y. And as we saw in our last lesson, we can actually compute the cross product of the tangent vectors in general. The cross product is minus partial f by partial x, minus partial f by partial y, and 1. Ah, therefore, our surface area is given by the double integral over d 
of the norm of this cross product, which is the double integral over d of the square root of 1 plus partial f by partial x squared plus partial f by partial y squared. Think back to our last example. We spent most of the time looking for the norm of this cross product. But if we're dealing with the graph of a function, z equals f of x, y, this is our norm. Knowing this from the start is going to cut down on the computations significantly. So let's try an example. Let's see if we can find the surface area of the graph of this function, z equals 2x squared plus y, over the triangle with vertices 0, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Since we're looking for the surface area of the graph of a function, we can use our formula from the last slide. The surface area is given by the double integral of this expression here. We don't need to calculate any cross products. We just need to know the partial derivatives of our expression with respect to x and y. If you calculate those partial derivatives, you should get 4x and 1 respectively. So this gives us a double integral of the square root of 2 plus 16x squared dA. Now to figure out the bounds of this integral, note that we're integrating over this triangular region with vertices 0, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 1. We could set up the integral either as type 1 or type 2. I don't want to have to find an antiderivative for this function with respect to x though, so why don't we set this up as an integral of type 1. We have x ranging between 0 and 1, y ranging between 0 and this line, y equals x, and inside we have the square root of 2 plus 16x squared dy dx. I'll let you verify that we get a final answer of root 2 over 16.